Hey Calculus class, today we are going to learn topic 33, antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. So antiderivatives, <clears throat> a function f is called an antiderivative of f on the interval i if big F prime is equal to little f for all x in the interval i. In other words, an antiderivative is the original function that has given you the derivative that you have. You are working backwards. Notation for the antiderivative. If the function big F is an antiderivative of the function little f, we can use the following notation. We say the integral of little f of x dx equals big F of x. When there are no limits, then the integral is called an indefinite integral. For example, <clears throat> since big F of x equals x squared, then it has an antiderivative of 2x. So that means we can write <clears throat> the integral of 2x dx as equal to x squared. Indefinite integrals. So we have that the integral of little f of x dx equals big F of x. This means that the derivative of big F is equal to little f. You should distinguish carefully between the definite integral and the indefinite integral. A definite integral is the integral from a to b of f of x dx, which is a number representing area. An indefinite integral, so the integral of f of x dx, is a function or a family of functions that is the antiderivative of the integrand. The general antiderivative. Theorem. <clears throat> if big F is an antiderivative of little f on the interval i, then the most general antiderivative of little f on i is big F of x plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. And the reason why we have this plus c or plus constant is because if we were to take the derivative of this, the derivative of big F would be little f, and we know that the derivative of a constant is zero. So for example, <clears throat> the most general antiderivative of 2x is x squared plus c. That is, the integral of 2x dx is equal to x squared plus c. Because if we were to take the derivative of x squared plus c, we still get 2x. Particular antiderivatives. <clears throat> a particular antiderivative is an antiderivative with a specific number for the constant c in the general antiderivative. For example, each of the following is a particular antiderivative of 2x. x squared, x squared plus 4, x squared minus 98, even x squared plus 1 million. All of those have the same derivative of 2x. <clears throat> Some basic antiderivative formulas. The first one is the addition slash subtraction rule. So <clears throat> we've seen this one before. Basically, if you take the integral of two functions that either are added or subtracted together, then you can split them up and take the integral of the first one plus or minus the integral of the second one. <clears throat> and we would usually call this big F of X plus or minus big G of X. <clears throat> Constant multiple rule. So this just means that if we have some constant multiplying my function, <clears throat> I can pull out my multiple constant, take the integral of my function first, and then multiply by my constant. In other words, you can think about it as your constant times the antiderivative, big F. The power rule. So this one's very, very important, and you're gonna use this one a lot. So if you are taking the integral of some number times x to the n. That means its antiderivative is you're going to add 1 to the new exponent, divide by the new exponent, plus c, where n cannot equal negative 1. 
the constant rule. <clears throat> Basically, the antiderivative of a constant is the constant times x plus c. The exponential rule, the antiderivative of a to the x is equal to a to the x over the natural log of a plus c. And of course, with base e, <clears throat> the antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x plus c, because the derivative of e to the x is itself. The natural logarithmic rule. So the integral of 1 over x dx is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c, because the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. 7. <clears throat> the zero rule. So the antiderivative of zero is just a constant, because we know the derivative of a constant is zero. Some trig antiderivatives. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the antiderivative of cosine is sine x plus c. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine plus c. Antiderivative of secant squared <clears throat> is a tangent plus c. The derivative of secant times tangent is secant plus c. Antiderivative of cosecant squared is negative cotangent plus c. <laughs> Antiderivative of cosecant cotangent is negative cosecant plus c. Antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is sine inverse plus c. And the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is tangent inverse plus c. And believe me, these you will want to memorize. All right, some examples. <clears throat> we want to find the general antiderivative for each function. So that means I am working backwards. I need to figure out which function gave me the derivative of x cubed plus two. So I'm going to first do, apply the power rule to x cubed. So I'm going to add one to the new x, to the exponent, which gives me x to the fourth, and divide by that new exponent. So I'm gonna divide by four. Now, since I have a constant here, the derivative of a constant times x is the constant. So I know the antiderivative of the constant is that constant times x. So my antiderivative is x to the fourth over four plus two x plus c. This is big, don't forget the plus c. You will lose a full point on the AP test if you forget the plus c. <clears throat> All right, in order to do number two, the first thing you're going to want to do is split it up into two separate fractions. So I have x to the fourth over x cubed, which gives me x, and then 3 over x cubed gives me 3 over x cubed. And then I can even simplify this further by bringing the x cubed up to give me x to the negative 3. Now I'm going to apply the power rule to both terms. So <clears throat> for the first term, I add 1 to the exponent, so I get 2, divide by the new exponent. I add 1 to the exponent, so I get negative 2, divide by the new exponent. And then of course, plus c. And then of course, simplify. Since I started with no negative exponents, I have to bring that x squared down to the bottom. All right, for example 3, you're going to want to change the roots to exponents. So the fourth root is the same thing as x to the one fourth. And since we have a power of three, that means we actually have x to the three fourths. And then of course, the square root changes to x to the one half. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing, power rule. Add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. So when I do that, I'm adding four over four to three fourths, which gives me seven fourths. And when I divide by 7 fourths, it's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal, which is 4 sevenths. Add 2 over 2 to 1 half, gives me 3 over 2. Divide by 3 over 2, same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. And then, of course, my plus c. 
All right, number four, sine over cosine squared. So for this one, I would recommend that you split this up so that you have sine over cosine times one over cosine. So <clears throat> that I can now say that sine over cosine is tangent and one over cosine is secant. And then we know from the antiderivatives of the trig functions that the, functions, the function who has the derivative tangent times secant is secant. And then of course my plus c. All right, another type that you're gonna see is what we call a differential equation, which is an equation that involves the derivatives of a function. The general solution of a differential equation involves an arbitrary constant or constants. The unique solution to a differential equation is an equation with the value for the constants. So in very simple terms, we will be given initial value, and after we find the antiderivative, we will then have to solve for c. So how do we do that? <clears throat> we want to find the unique solution for each differential equation. So that means, since I have given f prime, I need to find f, so I need to find the antiderivative. So I'm going to do the power rule, so add one to three, which will give me four, divide by four, eight divided by four gives me two. Add one to the exponent, so I get two, divide by two, 12 divided by two gives me six. And the antiderivative of constant is the constant times x, plus c. Now I have to solve for c. Well, I'm given that in my original function, x equals one, y equals six. So that means I can plug in one for x and six for y to get the following. And now I'm gonna solve for c. And I will get that c equals negative five. So therefore my final answer is f of x equals two x to the fourth plus six x squared plus three x minus five. <clears throat> All right, let's try this one. So in order to do this one, I'm gonna split it up to two different fractions. I have two thirds times one over x. Two thirds is just a multiple constant, so it's just gonna come along for the ride. And whose derivative is one over x? Well, that is the natural log of x and then of course my plus c. And I did want to mention quickly about the absolute value of x. The reason why when you take the antiderivative of one over x, you have to put absolute value symbols around the x with the natural log because we know that the argument of the natural log cannot be negative. And since we do not necessarily know um, <clears throat> the full domain of this function, we have to assume um, that x has to be positive, so we have to put the absolute value symbol. Well, on this function, I have f equals negative one, uh, which equals seven. So I'm gonna plug negative one in for x, seven in for y. The natural log of the absolute value of negative one, that's just the natural log of one. And <clears throat> so now the natural log of one that's just zero, so c equals seven. So now I can say that my final answer is f of x equals two thirds times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus seven. Number three, <clears throat> this time you're given the second derivative and you're given two initial conditions. That's because you're gonna have to find the first derivative then you'll have to find the original function. So you're gonna have two different c's. So <clears throat> I'm first gonna find f prime. So I'm just gonna keep working backwards, add one to the exponent, divide by that exponent. <clears throat> so I add one to three, I get four. 20 divided by four gives me five. Add one to two, I get an exponent of three. 12 divided by three gives me four. Antiderivative of a constant is the constant times x plus c. Since I know I'm gonna have two different c's, I'm gonna distinguish it by saying that this first c is c sub one. Now I'm going to do it again. I'm gonna apply the power rule to get 
x to the fifth because x to the fourth, add one to the exponent, I get five. Five divided by five gives me one. Same thing here, x to the fourth has a derivative of four x cubed. Um, four x, I'm gonna add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent to give me two x squared. Since this is just a constant, that means the antiderivative of the constant is the constant times x, plus my other c, which I'm calling c sub two. Now, <clears throat> I need to go ahead and plug in the first value I have, the first given. Well, when x is zero, I know that y is eight. So that's gonna be fairly easy for me to find c sub two. So c sub two equals eight. Now in order to find c sub one, I know that x is one and y is five. So now I have put eight in for c sub two, and I've put one in for x and five in for y. And so now I'm gonna solve for c sub one to get negative seven. So that means my final answer is f of x equals x to the fifth plus x to the fourth plus 2x squared minus 7x plus 8. All right, <clears throat> let's do a physics problem. A particle moves in a straight line and has acceleration given by a of t equals cosine t plus sine t. Its initial velocity is five feet per second and its initial displacement is zero feet. Find its position function, s of t. So, I first find the velocity function by taking the antiderivative of the acceleration function. So, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine plus c. Now, I'm gonna find c first before I move on and take the next antiderivative because I am given the initial velocity, which is five. So that means I know that when t is zero, the velocity is five. So I get the following. Sine of zero, well that's just zero. Cosine of zero is one. So I now have the following. I solve for c, and I get c equals six. So that means I have that my velocity function is sine t minus cosine t plus six. Now to find the position function, I'm gonna now take the antiderivative of the velocity function to get negative cosine t, because the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Antiderivative of cosine is sine. Antiderivative six is six t plus some constant. Now I do have to find this constant. Well, it tells me that my initial displacement is zero. So that means when t is zero, y is zero. So I'm gonna plug that in. I know that cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, and of course six times zero is zero. And when I solve for c, I get one. So that means my final um, position function is s of t equals negative cosine t minus sine t plus six t plus one. Well, I hope you love uh, working backwards and finding the antiderivatives. And I will see you in class tomorrow. Have a good night.